and one no, Lord and one faith and one baptism. I know there's one no, Lord and one faith and one baptism. And I'll tell it and I'll tell it everywhere. I go. I'm going to tell it, tell it, tell it, tell it everywhere I go. I'm going to tell it, tell it, tell it, tell it everywhere I go. I'm going to tell it, tell it, tell it, tell it everywhere I go. I'm going to tell it everywhere I go. His name is Jesus. 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 Everywhere I go. His name is Jesus. 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 Everywhere I go. His name is Jesus. 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 Everywhere I go. His name is Jesus. Everywhere I go. God bless you and thank you for tuning in to another broadcast. Voice in the Wilderness broadcast. I want to encourage you to stay tuned for the next 28 minutes and I'll let God speak to your soul. This is the place where eagles gather. Would you receive? Now, our radio and television announcement in the person of Sister Janelle Marshall. Receive with a hearty praise the Lord. Greetings and welcome to the Voice in the Wilderness broadcast emanating from Bethlehem Apostolic Temple, located at 330 North Main Street in Wheeling, West Virginia, and co sponsored by Shiloh Apostolic Faith Assembly, located at 3000 Weir Avenue in Weirton, West Virginia. These are the churches where the praises are going up and the blessings are coming down. We welcome you to join us each week. Our order of service is as follows In Wheeling, we begin every Sunday with our Christian education classes at 9 a.m., our morning worship begins at 10 30 a.m. In Weirton, Christian education classes classes begin at 10:45 a.m. and morning worship begins at 12:30 p.m. We ask that you join us for our midweek Bible class where our pastor district elder DW Cummings will be giving an inspiring lesson from the word of God in Weirton on Tuesdays at 7:30 p.m. and in Wheeling on Wednesdays at 7:30 p.m. Come with your Bible question and receive your Bible answer. You can listen to the Voice in the Wilderness broadcast on WWVA 11:70 a.m. on Sundays at 9:30 a.m. and 6 o'clock p.m. For more information on both ministries, you can visit our website at www.greaterloveministries.wv.org. Remember, you can also download our ministry app for iPhones and Android phones by going to your app store and searching Greater Love International. The Children for Christ Camp will be held July 9th through the 14th at Hallowed Hills Campground in Zanesville, Ohio. For more information, you can call the church office or visit the website of www.children4christcamp.org. Pastor Cummings will be teaching a special Bible class series for the five weeks in July and the first week in August on the fruit and the gift of the Spirit. Please join us for those special Bible classes. Do you have Pastor's last message entitled, The Silence of Men? You can purchase a CD or DVD by contacting our media department. Our thought for this week, it is better to take a risk now than always to live in fear. The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Hebrews 13, verse 6. Remember, you're welcome to any and all of our services. At this time, I would ask you to stand and greet our pastor as he leads us in the apostolic affirmation and the furtherance of the service. Let us put our hands together and give God praise as he comes. God bless you. Let's give that hand to who really belongs. Give God a hand praise. after me and say one Lord one faith and one baptism I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power somebody ever say power to save those that believe and I believe that Jesus saves and his blood washes wide in the snow let me tell you something else I believe I believe God is good when all the time. and all the time no matter what you're going through, no matter what problems you may be facing this week, the God we serve is a good God, yes. and he's worthy, yes, worthy. of all yes. the praise. Yes. And because he is good, we have found out that earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal. There is nothing that can happen to you on earth that God can't help you with. If thou canst believe, the Bible says, all things, somebody ever say all things, all things, are possible to those who would dare to believe. I want to encourage you to believe God today. Don't believe the circumstances. Believe God. Believe God. I'm going to ask as many of you will. If you go across the aisle and get your neighbor by the hand as we go to God in prayer. I need the old, I need thee every hour, I need thee, oh bless 
Bring down my Savior. I come to Thee. One more time. I need Thee. I need Thee. Oh, I need Thee. Let that be a cry that comes from your heart every hour. I need thee, oh bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. When we pray, would you pray for the person whose hands you're holding? We're praying for you, Mother Pew, and... Yes. We're praying for all those who are on our prayer list. Hallelujah. We haven't forgotten you, Sister Mayfield. Yeah. We're praying for you, Sister yes. Heather. Yes. With all yes. those Hallelujah. names that were called out and names on the prayer list, we want you to know when we're praying, we're praying for you. If you have a prayer request, write us and tell us about it, and we'll be praying for you as well. Let every heart pray, and when you pray, pray for the person whose hands you're holding. Let us look to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus. And we are convinced that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. You told us all we have to do is ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. You told us we have not because we ask not. But Lord God, we're asking in the name of Jesus, Lord. Heal today, Lord. Deliver today. Most of all, save today, Lord God. Work in that home. Work in that family. Work in that marriage. Lord God, let your power prevail in their life, Lord. Be what only a God can do, Lord. Show yourself strong even in this place today. Lord God, send your word today in unction and your anointing. In Jesus' name, can you drop the hands and begin to clap the hands. Heal blood pressure right now, Lord God. Heal diabetes right now, Lord. Heal, Lord God, that eye problem right now. In Jesus' name, amen. As you go back to your seat, tell somebody Jesus is a healer. Amen. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have. I'm singing in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. Oh, tell me who can God be for us when we call on His great name. It's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. We have the victory. I'm singing in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We have the victory. I'm singing in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Demons, demons will have to flee. Oh, tell me. Who can go be for us when we call on His great name? His name is Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. We have the victory. Amen. Get your say, man. Somebody just shout victory. victory. Amen. We have the victory. If you would turn with me this morning to the book of Isaiah. The fourth chapter, and uh, I'm sorry, the fifth chapter, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 4, and also in the book of Luke, the 20th chapter, Isaiah, the fifth chapter. And the book of Luke, the 20th chapter. If you have it, I'm going to ask those who are able, if you would stand as we give honor to the word of God. Isaiah, the fifth chapter. And we'll read verses 1 through 4. 
So, Ronnie, without a Bible, this is your opportune time to share yours with them. There's nothing better to share than the blessed word of God. Uh, also, you may look up on the screen. I believe it will be there for you as well. Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 4. If you have it, can you say amen? amen. Let us read together. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved have a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out of the stones thereof and planted it with the choices by and built a tower in the and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I, that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Look at Luke, the 20th chapter. Luke, the 20th chapter, and we're going to begin at verse 9. If you have that, I'm going to ask if you would be kind enough to read it as well. Luke, the 20th chapter, beginning at verse 9. If you have it, we'll read. Uh, we'll, we'll read as much as we can, beginning at verse 9. What does it say? Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and let it forth to a husbandman. And he went into a... And at the season he sent a servant to the husbandman that they should give him of the... But the husbandman beat him. And, and again he sent another servant. And they beat him also and entered him shamefully and sent him away. And again he sent a third, and they wounded him also, and then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my, it may be they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandman saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir, come let us, that the inheritance may be yours. Verse 15, so they and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard. Verse 16 and 17 is where we're closed. And he shall come and. And shall give the vineyard. And when they heard it they said. Verse 17. And he. And said what is this then that is written. The stone which the builders rejected. The same is become. Can church say amen. And I want to speak to you for a few moments from the subject. Just look at somebody and say, whose vineyard is it anyway? Whose vineyard is it anyway? Let us pray. Father, I pray that you send your word, your unction, and your anointing. Let not, Lord God, our coming be in vain. Lord God, open up our spiritual eyes to see what you would have us to see. Open up our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Save somebody. Heal somebody. Deliver somebody today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Somebody say, do it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you sit down, can you take your Bible, raise it up there, and say this affirmation with me. Say, this is my Bible. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. Every promise in the word of God can come true in my life. This morning, I will receive revelation knowledge, revelation understanding, and my life will never be the same again in Jesus' name. We sit down, give God your best. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we'll hear from Sister Faith, the sermonetic solo. Let's receive with hearty praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. On well, last week during the night service, I gave a little bit of my testimony, and I'll give a little, I'm not going to go into full detail, but I'll give a little bit of it now. God has really been delivering me from my depression because I've been out of a job and then I wrecked my car. So I was like, I was like contemplating suicide. I was like, God, I don't even care anymore. Just either you take me or I'm going to take myself. 
And for like days, sometimes a week, I wouldn't get out of bed. I would just lay there, cry, just think of different ways of how I could kill myself. And I want to thank God that I'm not 100% there. I'd say I'm 98% there, but that 2% I know is coming. And I just want to thank him for that. So the song that I'm going to sing today is Never Would Have Made It by Marvin Sapp. I'm ready. Never could have made it without you. I would have lost it all. But now I see all you were there for me. I can't say never. In the book of Isaiah, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 4, and Luke, the 20th chapter, verses 9 through 17, lean on somebody and say, whose vineyard is it anyway? Raise your hand and say, send your words, Lord. There was a man who looked upon a rocky, weed-infested hillside and valley. In his imagination, he could see a beautiful vineyard with uh, row after row of vines producing rich, delicious, juicy grapes. Other people could only see the rocks, the thorns, the problems, but this one man could see the possibilities. 
Isn't it God? Isn't it good that when other people only see the thorns in your life, God sees possibilities? Yeah, this man, he, he could envision the stones already being carried out. He stacked them to the form a great protecting wall, and he could see it, so it started to work to make this dream become a reality. He labored under the hot sun. It was hard. It was back-breaking work, but finally the stones were cleared away. He built a tower. Uh, he dug a wine press. He planted a protective hedge. The vineyard was finally planted. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. It, it was, the harvest was bountiful. It was abundant. The man had to travel to another country because he had other interests and other work required his attention. And to understand, he, he owned the vineyard. He had developed it and he had planted the vineyard, but he had to go on a trip. So he found some poor, unemployed people in the village who were merely making it, who were really starving, and he offered them the job of taking care of his vineyard. They could live in his home and care for his vineyard. They would uh, benefit from the work that he had already done, and they would profit from the abundant harvest he had already provided. Now, the only thing the owner wanted was a percentage of the fruit from the harvest. This was perfectly normal, a natural arrangement in first century Palestine. But our text in Luke, however, reports an unheard of development. It was the shocking behavior of the tenant. When the time of the harvest was come, the owner sent a uh, servant to receive the owner's percentage or uh, his portion. And the servant that uh, represented the order was, in fact, the owner's ambassador, and he was to be treated with the same courtesy and the same respect that would be given to the owner himself. But instead, the owner's ambassador was beaten and sent away empty-handed. And now he was not just ignored, he was treated with contempt. He was treated with resentment. It was, he was tied up and beaten with sticks and a whip, and he staggered back with his tragic report. The Lord or the owner of the vineyard could hardly believe what he had heard and what he had saw. Those tenants, when he first helped them, seemed so grateful. They had nothing when he found them. They were starving before they found them. And surely there had been some mistake. It, it, he, 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 so he sent a second servant. But uh, it happened again. Uh, uh, all, all claims of the Lord of the vineyard were rejected even though he was the reason for all the harvest that they had. They would not give him his portion. And uh, the servant was per perceived as a threatening enemy. The, the treatment of the second servant was even fiercer and more vicious than the first. He was beaten again and again and again. And he staggered back, cut, bruised, and bloody. The owner still could not believe that his generosity would be treated with such contempt. But, but here, right in front of him, there was uh, evidence of the opposite. He was ragged. He, he was a half-dead servant before him. His, his advisors wanted him to take soldiers and wipe out the tenants, a victim, get rid of them. Don't give them another chance. But the Lord of the vineyard hesitated. Even though they would not give him his portion or his percentage, even after all he had done for them uh, and all that they had done to his servants, he decided, I'll, I'll try again. So he called a third servant. Uh, by now, no one wanted the mission of going to that violent vineyard. He, he, it was turning out to be a suicide mission. Uh, then finally a servant was found to accept the mission. Uh, now, at first, he was welcomed. Then when they learned his identity, because he asked for the Lord of the Vineyard's portion, they said he was an agent of the enemy. 
he was one of the Lord's men, and uh, he's here to uh, receive the master's portion. Okay, they said, let's, let's give it to him right here. Uh, take this and take that and uh, uh, bind him and beat him and hit him and, and kick him uh, until his skin was broken and his skin was torn and, until uh, uh, his bones were broken. They, they tossed him outside the wall. And this one they really wounded and they, they cast him out. And now when this broken, battered servant arrived home, the owner of the vineyard was heard asking the question, what shall I do? What, what shall I do? It is now evident that the strategy of sending servants was not working. Uh, and then there was an uh, 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 awesome hush in the powerful drama as the Lord of the vineyard announced his decision. He said, I know what I'll do. I'll send my beloved son. It may be they will respect him. Uh, I'm sure his advisors and the officials were horrified. Not, not your son. Not, not your only son. It, it isn't worth it. These people will never change. They, 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 they'll destroy him. They'll punish him too. They, they, you've done enough for them already. Go send some soldiers down there. Kill them all. Teach them a lesson. Let them know who they're messing with. Well, the Lord of the vineyard had already made a decision. And he repeated I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will respect him. This was going to be a lonely journey for the young man. Uh, he knew the risk. Uh, he, he may have thought to run away. Uh, he had, however, uh, one great solitary purpose, and it was to obey his father, to, to, to follow his father's mission to return the vineyard from the rebels and to its rightful owner, which was his father. So he went unarmed. He, he walked in the dignity and the strength of his young manhood and knowing who his father was, the owner of the vineyard. And, and they, they saw him coming. Uh, you can almost hear their evil conversation. Uh, we, we hear them saying, uh, this is the heir. Let's kill him that the inheritance may be ours. We, we know who he is. That's the owner's boy. Uh, the word is whispered and passed along. This is the son. This is the heir. He's coming. Let's kill him. Let that the inheritance may be ours then. And he entered the vineyard, and they were waiting. <laughs> uh, they jumped upon him. He was, he was struck down with a lethal blow. They, they carried him outside the vineyard. There they hit him, and they kicked him, and they stumped on him until he was dead. He was dead. The Lord of the vineyard, son, was dead. Here, have another pitcher of wine, they said. Let's enjoy. Let's drink. Let's eat. It's ours now. The old man is powerless. The old man is beaten. He's dead. We killed his son. He's going to die of defeat. He's going to die of a broken heart. We're the master now. We're victors. It's all ours now. Jesus, he tells this story in the temple of Jerusalem. The scribes and the Pharisees, the elders, the religious people, the, the priests, many of them were listening. And when he finished the story, the first thing that came out of their mouth was, God forbid. Jesus concluded by Quoting from the Psalms, he says, The very stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And he then goes on to say, Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. And then Matthew adds, This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Let the people of the Lord say amen. I'm sure that you've recognized by now that the story is one of the most awesome and powerful of the stories of Jesus. Yes, it contains in it a few words, the real whole story of the Bible, uh, both Old and New Testament. It, everyone understood that the vineyard was the time-honored symbol of Israel. 
And what is shocking is uh, the reminder of Israel's relationship to God, the owner and the planter of the vineyard. And the people have rejected God. The people have rebelled. The people have taken over the vineyard as uh, you remember years ago, the Iranian students took over the embassy. And moreover, they have humiliated the owner of the vineyard. They've beaten his son and his servants. They've rejected the prophets. Here, here is Jeremiah. He calls the people to turn back to God. He, he, he throws them, they throw him into the prison. They, they put Jeremiah in, in stocks. They put him in an old abandoned cistern. He, he sinks in the slime and the mud, all because he told them the truth. Then you remember Amos, who was laughed at and ridiculed. And then there was the Hosea, whose heart is broken by the rejection of Israel. And here's Isaiah, whose message is totally ignored. It reminds me of Dr. Martin Luther King, who did not have great support while he was alive. Matter of fact, right before he died, he had the lowest, they had the post, had the lowest opinion of him until he was dead. And then everybody loved him. And God says, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be, it just may be that they will respect him. It is the mission of the son to restore the father's sovereignty. The, the cross left standing on a lonely hill is a sign of an apparent tragic failure of God's mission and the death of human rebellion and resistance to God and his lordship. And there are just three things I want to leave with you as I get ready to close. And I want to say about this parable. Three things the risen Lord is teaching. Three things that the church is teaching. The word is teaching. And number one is we are brought face to face with life's toughest question. And it's this. Who owns the vineyard anyway? Who do you really belong to? To whom do you belong? Uh, your life's hardest question is ultimately and finally a question of sovereignty. Who's in control here? Here's the Bible answer. It's found in Psalms 24 and 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Somebody say, help us, Lord. Then in Psalms 50 and 10, God says, For every beast of the forest and mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills, belongs to God. And then Paul told the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20, You are not your own, but you have been bought with a price. The songwriter picked it up and said, Not silver or gold, but you've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus and riches yet untold. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. The great warning of the Bible is a warning not to forget who you belong to. It's not important who you are. What is important is who you belong to. I don't want anybody to lie, but if it's true, tell somebody, I belong to God. Belong to God. Listen to Moses speaking to the people as they move from the Egyptian slavery to the land of promise. He says, for the Lord your God, this is Deuteronomy 8, chapter, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7. He says, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a, a good land, a land of brooks and water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines, of fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. He says you will eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. He said you didn't get it on your own. I gave it to you. Whose vineyard is this anyway? Moses goes on to say in that same chapter, Deuteronomy 8, down in verse 17, he says, after you blessed, after you're prospered, after you're healed, after you're delivered, he says, beware, beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and my might and my man have gathered this wealth. 
Moses said, remember, it's the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Yeah. He says in his warning, and if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you, this day you will surely perish. Like the nations the Lord made to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. You didn't know whose vineyard it was really. And that's one of the toughest questions of all. It's a question of ownership. It's a question of sovereignty. Who owns the vineyard? And here's a picture for us very clearly. The the real nature of sin. Sin is not just cheating. Sin is not just uh, uh, skipping close to the line or, or lying or missing church or drinking or getting high. Sin is trying to take over the vineyard. Sin is claiming that the vineyard is ourself and rebelling against God. Sin is ultimately the effort to try to be our own God. Say, I don't need God. I'll do what I want to do, when I want to do it, the way I want to do it, and who I want to do it to. But the second question, the second thing I want you to know, the parable of Jesus not only confronts us with the toughest question, but also with the hardest realization. It's this. The Lord of the vineyard, the Lord of the earth, wants to share all he has with us. That's right. He isn't trying to get something from us, something that belongs to us. He's really seeking to further bless and enrich our life. He's trying to get something to us. But he knows this can only really happen when we join him in a partnership in the vineyard management. And this is the great uh, 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 promises and affirmations that begin to come rushing out of the Bible. God is my unfailing source. Your job may let you down. The government may get rid of Medicare, may get rid of health insurance, but I look to the hills from which come in my help. My help comes from the Lord. Somebody shout hallelujah. They can close every plan as long as I got God. I know I can make it. He's the creator. He's the owner of all that I call my own. And when I accept his lordship and enter into a partnership with him, I am in a no-lose situation. No wonder Bishop McMurray used to say, I can't lose with the stuff I use. I've got the greatest financial resource backing me in the universe. His name is Jesus, and he's on my side. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.21, So let no one boast of men, for all things are yours. And then Paul says it again in the very next verse. All are yours, you are Christ, and Christ is God. That's sound resource management right there. That's the hardest realization is this. God wants to share the riches of heaven with you. He isn't trying to make you poor. He isn't trying to make you miserable. He's not trying to deprive you. He's doing exactly the opposite. He wants to bless me so that I can be a blessing to somebody else. But as long as I live under the illusion that the vineyard is mine, I perceive that the true owner of God as a threat and the owner's servant as a sort of despised tax collector. And on the other hand, when I answer life's toughest question correctly, the hardest realization has no power to make me negative or resistive or defensive. I realize and understand that God is my friend. I am a friend of God. Somebody say amen. amen. He doesn't just want my money. He wants my heart. He wants my mind. He wants my commitment. He wants all of me wants me to be free from the can't help it. He wants me to be free from having to go to a bar to get help. 
He wants to be free from sin. He wants to make me a citizen of heaven. He wants me to have a means of being blessed and healed so I can be a blessing and heal others. He says to you and me, all things. Somebody help me say all things are yours. Uh, I, God is truly with me and for me to as my unfailing source. That's life. That's the hardest realization. Uh, and I told you that life's toughest question, who owns the vineyard? And life's hardest realization, God really cares about me and loves me and God can be trusted. Now, I want to talk about life's ultimate decision. It's the decision about what to do about Jesus. Uh, it's God who's waiting for your answer. Uh, what will you do about Jesus? Uh, he could make you obey, uh, but he never does. Uh, he could make you fall on your knees, uh, but he doesn't. Uh, he gives you the freedom of choice. Uh, it is God who risks rejection. Uh, it is God who risks the pain of you saying no. Uh, it is God who says, I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will respect him. Uh, God gives everything on a maybe. Somebody say maybe. Uh, it's not a sure thing. Uh, think of it for just a moment. Uh, the thought is really staggering. It's breathtaking. Uh, God has taken the greatest chance on you and me. He has given himself Utterly, completely for us with no guarantee. He says, I'll send my beloved son. It may be that they will respect him. My response to Jesus Christ is an act not only of trust and faith. It's more than that. It's an act of praise. Every time I'm praising God, it's telling God, I trust you. Every time I tell God, thank you, it's telling him, I trust you. Every time I say hallelujah anyhow, I said I, I don't trust the circumstance. I trust God. My trust is in the Lord. It's a way of saying thank you, Father, for taking a chance on me. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, uh, for not giving up on me. Uh, thank you, God, for seeing the possibilities in my life. Uh, when everybody else saw the rocks and saw the problems and saw the thorns, you saw the possibilities. I'm, Lord, I'm yours. Everything I am, everything I got, I'm yours. Try me now and see if I can be completely yours. You'll walk around singing all to Jesus. I surrender all to him. I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence. Daily live. I surrender. I surrender all. I surrender. I surrender all. I hope you never have the experience. But sometimes when somebody's robbing somebody, they tell them. They put a gun in their back, a knife in their back, whatever they do. But the next thing they will tell them sometimes is raise your hands as a sign of surrender. And when you raise your hands, you're telling the robber, you can take my money, you can take my purse, you can take my car, but save my life. And I want you to know when you raise your hands to God, you're saying, God, I don't care about the car. I don't care about the money. All I care about is save my life, save my soul. I want to be what you want me to be. I want to say what you want me to say. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, and I am the clay. Mold me, make me. After your will, while I'm waiting, yield it is still. Have your way, Lord. I know who the vineyard belongs to. Look at somebody say, whose vineyard is it anyway? 
Bill Russell, a great NBA Hall of Famer, one of the greatest college basketball players there ever was, writes in his book about temptations and how temptations almost destroyed his career. He talks about how his mother made some banana pudding and uh, his mother and Mr. Charles, that's his father, went out visiting and the last thing mother said was don't eat the banana pudding. It's for dinner later on. And Bill Russell writes in his book and he said when she said don't eat it, that's all he could think about. Eating the banana pudding. He knew it was for him he, just later on. And uh, he said he, he just kept looking at the banana pudding. And the more he looked at it, he said he just took a little finger and just, there was a little hanging over the plate there, a little hanging over the bowl there. Just, nobody's going to miss it. So, so he just, he took a, just got a little, mm, oh yeah, this is good banana pudding. And he thought in his mind, he said, you know what? They're not going to miss that. You know, I'm just going to take one spoonful. That's all I'm going to take is one spoonful. Your mama knows she knows how to make some banana pudding. And, just, and she, he took a spoonful. He said without thinking, he took a second spoonful. He had ate half of it. He said, oh, my God. And when he realized he had ate half of it, he said, well, I'm in trouble anyway. So I might as well eat the other half. And then his mother and his father came home. And he put locks on all the doors. And his parents couldn't get in the house. And his parents were knocking on the door saying, Bill, let us in. And then his mama said, you probably ate the banana pudding, didn't you? Uh, and he says the reason we lock God out of our life is because we know we ate the banana pudding. But God is saying, I love you anyway. Just come to me. Admit what you've done. I still love you. Don't you know whose vineyard this is anyway? So our scripture teaching us when we make a positive response to life's ultimate decision that is saying yes to Jesus Christ then the rebellion and the conflict in the vineyard will be ended somebody shout hallelujah and then order and beauty which God intended will be restored and that's the harvest that God is seeking for this vineyard when we respond positively to life's toughest questions, to life's hardest realization, to life's ultimate decision, we enable that kind of thing to happen. And I remember a Christmas Sunday, 1988. It was the day our oldest son, Claude Cummings, came down the altar after I preached. And I didn't know what Claude wanted. He said he wanted to be baptized. And I asked Claude, I said, do you know what it means to be baptized? And Claude said, yes. And you can't imagine the joy I had as a father to baptize my oldest son and know all his sins were washed away. He had answered life's toughest question. He understood life's hardest realization. He had made life's ultimate decision. He had accepted Jesus Christ. And what joy it brings to a father to see his son and his daughter surrender their life to God. And that's the harvest that God is seeking this morning from his vineyard. The harvest of somebody saying, I want to change my life and turn it over to Jesus Christ. It's children who love and trust God. And I tell you one thing, I will never forget the look on Claude's face when he made the right decision. And God will never forget the look on your faith, face when you say, I want to repent of my sins, be baptized in his name, and be filled with his spirit. The question is, 
What will you do with Jesus Christ? He says, I'll send my beloved son. And it may be that they will reverence and respect him if they just find out whose vineyard it is anyway. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I've done my best to preach your word. And I pray that something has been said that's been a blessing to someone. You're reminding us whose vineyard this is. Our life belongs to you. You're in charge. We're honored to be your servant. And I pray right now that we will never try to take over the vineyard. Never try to control it and say it belongs to us and you don't deserve anything. But help us to always give you your portion. And I pray now that somebody will answer life's ultimate question and make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. As they sing all to Jesus, I surrender. If you're here today, and I believe that you are, man, woman, boy, or girl, and you've never repented of your sins, you've never been baptized in his name, you've never been filled with his Holy Spirit, I don't care how young you are or old you may be, this is the time to answer life's ultimate question. Whose vineyard is it anyway? Who does your life belong to? Why would you ask God to help you if your life doesn't belong to him? I'm begging you, give your life over to Jesus. And you can smile the rest of the day. Is there one, whether you need healing or deliverance, whatever, they, can't you hear him calling you? Today is your day. Come to him. Is there one? All oh, to surrender, I surrender all. Well, it's I surrender, I surrender all. All to thee, all to thee, my bless. I surrender, I surrender.